Fantastic. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Jen. Um, I'm not 100 I'm not 100% sure. In fact, I am 100% sure that Lee and I are definitely not going to live up to the expectations that have just been created. But what I will say is, is that in preparing tonight's session, Lee did want to recite the 87,000 words from his PhD, but we decided against it for, for time purposes. But I'm sure it would have been a beautiful um, addition to the uh, uh, to the events of this evening. And um, maybe Lee will, Lee will uh, deliver it as an audio book uh, in the uh, near future. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. And thank you so much to Jen and to Amy for inviting us to be part of this book. Um, it's something as soon as we, we saw the email uh, come over from both Jen and Amy that we jumped on board because we think it's such a novel idea to really challenge some of those commonly held perceptions within the field and really give us the opportunity to talk about something from a theoretical and practical perspective that we think is really important because we do understand some of those, uh, some of the traditions, some of those expectations that are held around the field of coaching that is fundamentally evolving all the time. So hopefully over the next um, hour, well, hour, hopefully we'll be done within 40 minutes and we can, we can have a little bit more of a conversation. Uh, we're just going to talk about some of those things that, well, some of those arguments that we presented within the chapter itself. Um, but more importantly, I suppose, start to talk about what the potential solutions are, if that's the right term. I suppose what we're trying to do is challenge this particular myth, challenge this particular idea and then identify some potential ways that we can make things better. Again, if, if that's the term, I'm not saying they're bad at the minute, but arguably they, they, they might be. Um, Lee, um, the contact details for Lee and I are on the screen there, simply because if you were interested in following any of this up, challenging anything that we don't get time to challenge tonight, if you're interested in getting involved in any research or getting us involved in any research, then please don't hesitate to uh, drop us an email. We'd be happy to continue conversations outside of tonight's session and also to, to explore potential research avenues or potential avenues for impact from, from what we're talking about. So please uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, as Jen alluded to, we are going to ask you to kind of engage throughout. Um, if you want to put any questions in the uh, chat box, please uh, do so. We'll try and deal with them as we go along, but most likely we'll deal with them as we go, uh, sorry, towards the end of, of, of tonight's session. But we, we do have some questions for you. I'm really interested in what your thoughts are around this because they help us to frame some of the things that we're going to be talking about. And so the first thing that I ask you to think about and to put your responses in the chat, if that's okay, is the question that's on the screen here. As a coach, what do you think the one biggest thing or what what's that one thing that has the biggest impact on your or a coach's effectiveness if you had to narrow it down to one thing what would that one thing be if you could add some stuff into the uh, chat that would be fantastic so thinking about coach effectiveness what one thing has the biggest impact on that individual's ability to be effective within their role whatever that might be whether we're talking about um, the elite levels of coaching, whether we're talking about performance coaching, development coaching, or uh, participation, um, what do you think that one thing particularly is? If you can add some stuff into the chat, that would be great. And whilst I'm waiting for those things to come through, um, I will sort of praise you tonight's session with, we probably wrote the chapter and the, the research that we're going to talk about throughout uh, the session, we probably wrote that with elite coaches in mind but many of the principles will relate across the different levels of the different um, modalities of coaching. So um, we make no apologies for probably talking about the more elite end tonight, but there's definitely transfer across. So some of the things coming in, thank you very much for, for sharing these. Uh, knowing the person and athlete, yeah, absolutely, Trish. I think, that's, I think there's plenty of research and, and plenty of uh, anecdotal evidence to suggest that if we know the individual that we're working with, we're more likely to be able to engage with that individual in a way that's meaningful and effective. Celine, link to that communication. That's fantastic. Uh, time from athlete, time from athletes and coaches. Time is always going to be a big issue. And obviously it's linked directly to the, to the myth that we're challenging tonight. We're probably arguing for less time, more productivity, more effectiveness, rather than more time, less productivity, less effectiveness. Uh, Ross, communication probably plays a big part. Yeah, absolutely. Listening skills, emotional intelligence, lovely. Emotional connection with players, 
there's lots and lots of things coming through on uh, the chats here. And I think it's really interesting that when we ask this question across different uh, groups, different populations, we get very similar responses. So it would seem that we kind of have this relatively agreed or accepted understanding that lots of the things that will make coaches effective are related to their ability to, abilities to interact those interpersonal skills, if you like, about building relationships, about working with individuals, understanding individuals, communicating, um, yeah, JP, flexing interaction according to the individual. And this for me is, is hugely important because everything that's been written on the chats here probably relates to one thing. If we were to do some sort of thematic analysis, it probably relates to the, the thing that has the biggest impact on the coach's effectiveness. And fundamentally, that is the coach. The coach has the biggest impact on their effectiveness because they, to a greater or lesser extent, have the ability to control many of the things that you've, or influence many of the things that you have written uh, into the chat there. And this, for us, isn't really revela uh, revelationary, revelationary, revelatory, um, but it is important to recognize because I think we do miss it significantly when we're talking about coaching and we're talking about what what coaches do and how they make their coaching practice better and that's probably perpetuated in some extent by uh, national governing body coaching qualifications that tend to focus quite heavily or have traditionally focused quite heavily on the sport rather than on the act of coaching itself and so i suppose as part of our argument a part of the way in which we have challenged the myth around this being a 24-hour job is that we have to place the coach at the centre of what they do in order, to, in order to understand how we might make it better. And certainly this, um, this uh, uh, quote here comes from a uh, NFL coach um, who discussed the importance of that concept that I mentioned about um, coaching should be about understanding how well we're doing the job, not how long we're doing the job. And this comes from a, obviously a relatively uh, a sport that's relatively intense in terms of it's got a very short season, very few games, high levels of intensity and scrutiny, etc. But it's probably that perception about the quality of what we do and making sure that people are placed well in order to perform and engage in high quality practice than it is over the amount of time that we're actually spending doing things. And so... Again, I suppose the challenge that we've we've dealt with or dealt with, uh, attempted to answer um, the challenge that we pose to to uh, yourselves and to ourselves and to the, the coaching population, if you like, is uh, the statement on the screen here. And that refers directly to um, what commitments are organisations and individuals willing to make to ensure that coaches or themselves are well positioned to perform effectively. And that's where we'd really like to start the uh, discussions and the, the conversations this evening around this. And I, I appreciate, I don't know, Bully, can you see on the screen here? Have I drawn two red lines on the screen? Yes, you have. <laughs> I haven't got a clue how that's happened uh, or how I'll get rid of them. But uh, uh, we'll keep them there for now. I think they add to the aesthetics of this presentation. <laughs> Looks like my uh, A-level art skills are coming into uh, coming into fruition here. So, um, in terms of this concept of coaching is a twenty-four hour a day job, we totally appreciate that many individuals and organisations widely describe coaching as as a twenty-four hour a day role. We we understand that, and in fact, in a document that was published by the um, uh, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, on the qualities of great coaching. They stated that coaching is in many ways a 24-7, 365 days of the year job as top coaches uh, live and sleep the art of coaching. However, we don't really share or, or support such a sentiment. And so in our chapter, I suppose, we aim to present an argument to challenge that myth, identifying it as arguably unhealthy, arguably counterproductive, and... Um, it's probably a problematic as a way of thinking about, talking about, and actually doing sports coaching. And so through this presentation, we're going to aim to achieve these uh, particular things. 
The first is we want to challenge this, this concept, and we'll do that by presenting why, it's the, why the job is potentially viewed as a 24-hour uh, a day role first. And then we'll talk about our response to that, which is about the coach being a performer. I'm then going to pass on to uh, my esteemed colleague, Lee, who's going to talk about uh, some of the research that's come out of his PhD that happened before we wrote the book chapter and after that we wrote the book chapter as a way of sort of demonstrating some empirical evidence to support what we're, we're arguing, but also um, to identify the, you know, the continuity of the arguments that we present here through the research, but also through practice. And then finally, we'll, we'll end on with um, some practical implications, some strategies potentially for encouraging what, what we're going to argue is thriving or that position of uh, what performance might look like from a coaching perspective. Again, if you have any comments, thoughts, issues, Please don't hesitate to put them on the chat as, as we go through, but I, I will be uh, asking you to get involved uh, as we do that. OK, so in terms of presenting the, the myth, uh, if you like, in the first instance, um, I suppose the first thing to mention is that we understand that coaches are being placed under um, increasing expectation to fulfil an expanding number of roles that encompass as uh, Rin and colleagues suggested, direct, indirect, and public relation tasks. So direct tasks would be those things that coaches are probably prepared and trained for, i.e. training episodes, the actual coaching part, performance management, et cetera. Indirect tasks might be budgeting, organizing of contracts, transport, um, could be programming, um, uh, and organizing a, a general related tasks uh, outside of the arena for performance and coaching. And then public relation tasks are those things related to dealing with uh, the media, uh, operating as an ambassador for the club, um, dealing with other stakeholders or meeting with other stakeholders, et cetera. So we understand that, again, across the modalities of coaching, across the different contexts in which coaches operate, that these roles are developing, but though, though, sorry, those responsibilities are developing. But we also understand that those responsibilities will be dictated by, by the uh, context that the coach operates in directly. One of the things that we wanted to highlight within our chapter was that in order to fulfill many of these roles, coaches also need to build and maintain multiple relationships with stakeholder groups. And we talk, uh, we built on the work of um, Peter Olashoga by suggesting that um, these stakeholders, uh, in, in order to do this, uh, it requires coaches to engage in considerable time, commitment and engagement. If you think about um, the relationships that you build across the multiple areas of your lives, how long they take, the effort that you have to put into maintaining those, and then you couple that with the pressure cooker that, that um, elite coaches or elite athletes might operate in, we appreciate that it does take quite a lot of time um, to, to fulfil that particular responsibility or that particular aspect of the coaching role. And as a result, it's quite easy for us to understand that you know, coaches are going to start to put more and more effort into these particular responsibilities. And as a way of managing a perception of control or a perception of power within that, that, within that particular role, coaches often end up working unsociable and extended hours that encroach on their personal lives. Um, and I suppose, essentially, the, the balance becomes blurred or the balance becomes affected uh, between what is essentially work life and social life and the amount of time then that coaches have to recover from from their particular roles I can't believe these two red lines are on my screen here every time I check my peripherals I just see these two train tracks um, I'll try and get rid of them when when Lee takes over in a second the second thing that we wanted to mention around this is that we, we understand that as a result of this increasing amount of uh, these, these increasing amount of roles if you like that um, the uh, nature of coaching is, is fundamentally uh, demanding. Uh, and that, that's problematic in itself in that um, coaches are faced with a range of uh, demands that emanate not only from performance associated with those things that they are probably trained to do, i.e. coaching and uh, managing competitions, but also from organisational and personal sources. And I suppose this ongoing, uh, whilst those demands, I suppose, have been identified for, for quite some time, the ongoing professional development of the uh, field itself has arguably intensified some of those uh, demands. 
particularly given the growing internal and external pressure that's placed on coaches at an elite level to perform or to get their athletes to perform due to the uh, increased financial incentives that are associated with uh, winning as well as things like the increasingly volatile nature of professional sporting environment, the enhanced scrutiny that coaches are placed under, the greater prevalence of short-term contracts um, that link to uh, performance cycles or competition cycles that coaches have to manage, and the high levels of job insecurity that are caused by um, high rates of job turnover and arguably the uh, financial impact of that on coaches' personal lives as well. So as a result of all of these demands and you know, this intensifying nature, if you like, of elite sports, coaches have to cope with those particular things in a way that allows them to function appropriately. Um, however, what we have to understand is, is that coaching requires considerable effort. And as a result, um, the coping that coaches have to engage in requires them to ensure that they're in the right physical and mental states in order to make good decisions and employ appropriate coping mechanisms that can be effective in relation to the context that they're operating in at that particular point in time. Despite us understanding this, in a recent review by um, Olsen and colleagues in 2020, they identified that coaches' coping efforts were only moderately effective in dealing with the demands that they were um, faced with. And also that coaches tend to employ a lot, lots of strategies that involves them increasing the amount of personal investment and personal effort they, that they put into dealing with that particular issue at that particular uh, point in time. And so what we see is, is increasing workloads being devoted to trying to cope with the demanding nature of uh, uh, the coaching environment that these individuals are operating in, as well as inadequate coping skills and insufficient time away from the job, which ultimately leads to arguably critical health situations and the uh, experience of burnout as a result of experiencing emotional uh, exhaustion. The third thing that we would kind of argue within building this understanding of the myth is that we understand that some coaches um, would argue that they have a level of motivation, persistence and passion for the role. And as a result, they are quite happy to engage in extended working hours um, and they're quite happy to allow that to impinge on their social lives and allow that, that to consume what they do in and out of their job roles. We would argue that those perceptions potentially stem from the expectations that stakeholders have of coaches in which a more is better attitude is created concerning the coach's workload. And um, we probably think that the, uh, those perceptions also stem from that notion of or that traditional notion of coaches being immune to the potential negative consequences of the demands that they're faced with, or at least that they're able to act in a way that presents themselves as being immune or, or um, not being affected by, so that, that it doesn't affect athlete perception and athlete per, uh, performance too. So, so we have this building um, situation where we understand that in order to do the role, coaches are perceiving that they have to put more and more hours into not only fulfilling their responsibilities, but dealing with the demands that are associated with that. And as a result, we're starting to see increases in the, in the prevalence of burnout. And again, there's been some fantastic work done by Peter Olsoga, Kylie McNeil, uh, Goran Kenter, amongst many others, just a few, if you're interested in reading some research around this, um, that look at coach burnout and, and uh, what it is. Um, so, yeah, I suppose what, what we uh, argued is that the circumstances, perceptions and expectations that are placed on coaches or that are built into this perception of what coaching actually is, results in coaches believing that the job uh, is one that requires that 24 hours a day commitment and that is problematic. And whilst this concept of burnout uh, has been debated in terms of the causes uh, of burnout, many seem to agree that uh, excessive workloads are partly responsible. Burnout itself is considered as a negative work-related um, uh, construct or a uh, syndrome, if you like, that is highly prevalent, as we've mentioned, but it's also linked to uh, three different characteristics. And these are kind of important if we're thinking about how we might protect against the onset of burnout. Um, first and foremost, it's linked to this concept of ill-being, and Lee will pick this up a little bit uh, in, in a little bit. 
but it's also linked to uh, the three characteristics of depersonalization, uh, emotional exhaustion, and um, reduced sense of uh, personal uh, accomplishment. So these, these things are directly related to the experience of ill-being, as I've mentioned, and uh, it's widely uh, considered to be a, a particularly negative health-related uh, syndrome. So I suppose, given all of this that I've mentioned so far, we agree with the initial thoughts of Dan Gould and um, Richard Farewell, amongst others who have, have reported this more recently, who argued for some time that coaches should be seen as performers in their own right, because they have to deal with an ever-expanding number of demands, they've got to fulfil a number of responsibilities, but they are also responsible and accountable to and for the organisations that they work for and the athletes that they work with. And certainly, if coaches are asking athletes to get a little bit better at, on every time that they work together, then there's no reason that coaches shouldn't be asking that of themselves also. And as a result, we need to start, or we should really be seeing and talking about and bringing into the discourse that we have around coaching, this concept that coaches are performers, and as a result, they need to act like uh, performers in that uh, particular sense. And we also argue then that if coaches are performers, no job can really, or no job or no performance can really be sustained for 24 hours a day over extended periods of time. And really that was the crux of our, our argument uh, uh, around this. And to bring my, um, bring my uh, first section or this first section to a conclusion, I'm gonna pose this question to you all based on what I've just talked about there. And then just bring up a couple of other points that really link to why uh, we think that this myth should be challenged. The first one is, if we do buy into this concept of, of coaches being performers, I'd be interested for you to put into the uh, chat box here what you think performance for a coach actually looks like. What does it involve? So if coaches are performers, what does performance actually involve? Or what does it look like? What does it include? What, what do coaches need to do? If you could give us some uh, insight into uh, that, it would be uh, fantastic on the uh, on the chat there. So what does performance look like for coaches? Sorry, I'm just going to try and get rid of these uh, red lines. I don't even know. Uh, how, how. You, you might have some options up on the top bar. One might be... Ah, right. Absolutely, yes, of course. Okay. It is from, uh, I thought it was from PowerPoint and not uh, from, uh, not from. Um... Thanks for saving the day there, Amy. Appreciate it. No Amy, you're, you're on absolute flames. <laughs> Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, thoughts in terms of what it means to be a performer. Oh, there we go, fantastic, I'm back. Engage, engagement, so engagement in the process, being fully engaged, being there for athletes, really interesting view. Analysis, planning and delivery along with everyday soft skills. Yeah, absolutely, I think, I think these concepts of soft skills are becoming more and more prevalent, certainly within uh, the realms of coach education in terms of how we're developing uh, people uh, within this particular domain, within this particular profession, certainly. And I think those things obviously link to or are the glue between that, those concepts of analysis, planning and delivery. Yeah, JP, I, lo I love that idea at the end that performance is about improving. It's about understanding that there are always opportunities to make things better or to, or to sustain performance. And as a result, we have to adopt that sort of attitude that allows those things uh, to happen. Yeah, communicate and relay messages, engage the athletes, yeah, deliver sessions that engage the athletes. Yeah, so thinking about, uh, and Anita, thinking about those things on uh, that, that might happen during the training, training episodes or, or uh, competition episodes about making sure that we engage athletes. But this might also be a little bit more wide wider than that about how we engage athletes in and around uh, the performance environment or the training environment yeah alan being present within the session again all, all of these points that are being presented here are really really interesting and 
actually, while we've whilst we've argued for some time that coaches should be performers, I'm not ever I'm not 100% sure whether we've really had a good go at understanding what that means or what it looks like. Um, yeah, Ross. Yeah, performing as a coach first. First, the roles would be the performance. Yeah, a- absolutely. So it might be just going back to those uh, primary that the primary aspect of what it is to be a coach in order to really understand what it means to perform. And Ben, certainly, as I've kind of mentioned, spinning plates is a great way to end this part of the conversation because I think coaches uh, do that regularly. Uh, just going back to that point there, Ross, and to, uh, to some of the points that um, other people have mess- uh, 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 placed on the uh, chat there, I think there is a big issue around this understanding of uh, clarity over roles and responsibilities. And as a result, as they become blurred, we put more pressure on coaches to do more things. And as a result, they end up spending longer and longer in, within the job that arguably doesn't create better practice. It creates more problematic uh, practice in that, in that sense. Um, OK, I'm going to move on. I appreciate there's lots of things that I haven't picked up there, but maybe we can come back to them. I think one of, one of the things that we have to think about, and uh, this concept of thriving has been talked a bit about quite a bit from an athlete perspective, but I think we need to sort of look at this from a coaching perspective too, is that performers are able to thrive. And I think that links back to, to uh, the point that Trish has put on about creating environments, not only that enable players to flourish or athletes to flourish, but also that enable coaches to flourish. And I think... Um, I think Susie's put something on there without reading it all about obviously the toxic culture that's involved within lots of performance environments um, it, it is slightly problematic too. So maybe this concept of thriving is an important way of considering what coach performance looks like. And within the thriving literature, people would divide, people like Dan Brown um, and Elliot, uh, Elliot Newell would define thriving as a state of well-being, performance and growth that kind of happen together. I think what Lee and I are going to present for the rest of this presentation is around the concept that actually we think that well-being probably underpins much of the other two, because we would argue that growth is part of uh, hedonic uh, perspectives of well-being and performance is potentially an outcome of experiencing well-being. And so we would totally agree that actually environments, et cetera, need to be uh, linked to those principles that allow coaches to experience eudaimonic factors of, of well-being and eudaimonic factors of well-being are more like process elements that are linked to the experience of personal growth, the ability to live one's values, the ability to shape and, and live one's identity, uh, the, the um, experience of meaningful relationships in one's life. And we think that by creating situations that would satisfy those or enge- allow individuals to experience those process elements, that they're going to experience some hedonic outcomes. So hedonic aspects of well-being are linked to happiness, satisfaction, positive effect, et cetera. We also think that well-being is linked to a, a balance between resources and demands that, in that humans will thrive most successfully when they are placed under a level of demand, but they're placed under demands in which they feel as though they have the personal resources in order to cope effectively with those demands and demonstrate adaptive responses to those particular demands rather than not being put in uh, demanding or challenging situations at all. And as a result, we, we believe that um, as a way of overcoming the potential concept of coaching being a 24-hour day job, we really need to think about organisational change in order to uh, build the right sorts of environments and cultures in which uh, coaches can thrive, but also ensuring that coaches are appropriately equipped with the coping mechanisms that they need in order to cope effectively with the demands that they're placed under and thus uh, be in a position in which they can experience well-being on a more regular basis. Okay, I've taken up far too much time. Um, th- that was a bit of a, an overview of our chapter and, and the things that we've talked about. We'd like to sort of back this up now with um, a little bit of evidence from uh, Lee's PhD. So I'm going to pass you over to Lee. Um, Lee, do you want to take control of the slides? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just going to take uh, control over the slides here. Um, firstly, good evening to everyone. And uh, I'd like to firstly thank you all for persisting me a participation on the call, despite Brendan emulating his best efforts of being a, a modern-day Picasso throughout the majority of that uh, initial opening. And uh, 
Amy, for yourself, even engaged in a bit of think aloud uh, reflection there in relation to his ability to uh, to emulate Picasso. So uh, he's bringing in some of the Monday concepts, I suppose. Um, moving forward with this particular discussion, Brendan and I thought that it might be quite nice to uh, advance the discussions in relation to what he's raised already. Um, in relation to perhaps exploring some of my research that I've conducted over the last four or five years in relation to the stress and mental ill and well-being experiences of, of elite football coaches, and perhaps exploring some of the underpinnings and implications of engaging in 24-7 hour workloads in the context of elite football. We thought that by providing some of this, or providing more insights, I suppose, into um, so, some more up-to-date um, exemplifications, I suppose, of uh, this this myth. We thought that it might add to, to some of the discussion today and, and perhaps advance understanding. And so, while well, I just try and operate these slides. There we go. Um, and so, for the rest of this, uh, or for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I just want to talk through a couple of studies that I conducted as part of my PhD. Uh, one that's titled uh, The Stress and Mental Wellbeing Experiences of Professional Football Coaches, which was more of a, a cross-sectional approach to exploring the stress and mental wellbeing experiences of professional football coaches. And then I also conducted a second study looking at how uh, stress and mental ill-being and elite football coaches fluctuated over time. Now, through that exploration, I suppose what we unearth uh, largely linked to some of the contentions that we raised within the MIFS chapter. And so... I'm going to try and talk through some of the underpinnings behind why this 24 seven hour work mentality may exist, particularly in the realm of elite football, but then start to touch on, I suppose, um, what that potentially leads to for coaches in terms of their ability to perform in their jobs, their lives away from the role and ultimately their mental and well-being. So I suppose where I want to start here is understanding the why, what goes into individuals engaging in intense workloads within the realms of elite football. And so I'm going to start to talk about some of the underpinning uh, reasons, I suppose, as to why individuals actually engage in, in some of this, uh, in some of these endeavors over time. So throughout my exploration of stress uh, and mental well-being and elite football coaches, what we found was that participants reported an array of performance, organizational and personal demands associated with their role that naturally influenced or enhance their perceptions of workload. Now, in, re in, in relation to the particular environments that I actually research, so when we consider elite football as a context, I suppose this particular environment or the nature of the sport, it means that for coaches who operate at the elite level of the sport, they operate in conditions that are heavily contested. They operate in conditions or they operate in roles that are, that are, are, are dynamic in nature often involve high levels of job insecurity to the point where coaches who operate at the elite level in, in elite football or soccer, if anybody's uh, attending the call from outside of the UK, uh, they're often suggested to be um, only ever six games away from getting the sack. And the research would suggest that individuals operating in the top four leagues of English football uh, generally operate in these roles for roughly around 270 days in terms of average tenure. And so as a result of this, this drives individuals um, to, on a daily basis, try and obtain professional credibility from key stakeholders operating in the sport, because ultimately their livelihoods are, are at stake. And often, particularly for those who are operating under the English Premier League, um, these individuals, when potentially getting the sack, often struggle to, to then get jobs at that level again, um, due to many coaches existing that are currently out of work and obviously go in for a small number of roles. And so the conditions that, that surround the elite football as a sport mean that coaches are under uh, constant uncertainty, I suppose, and are constantly uh, uh, mean, uh, constantly mean, sorry, that they, they possess a drive to try and maintain this professional credibility. Now, in our research, what we found was that through our exploration of the stress experiences of coaches, we saw to explore the situational properties that really underpin those stresses. And what we found kind of emanating from this exploration was that many of the coaches, due to the conditions that I've just suggested, uh, reported some situational properties associated with self and other comparison. 
So trying to compare themselves to other coaches or trying to ensure that other, coach, uh, other coaches and other key stakeholders saw them in positive light in terms of their ability to fulfill their roles effectively. They suggested that given the plethora of demands that they experienced on a day-to-day -day basis, that often the timing of events uh, underpinned these demands. And what I mean by that is that these coaches suggested that they were often experiencing a, a range of demands all at the same time. And as a result, that created conditions whereby it enhanced their perceptions of workload because they were experiencing a range of demands all at the same time. And so timing of events underpinned many of the stresses experienced. And then uncertainty, so not really, uh, not really knowing or having control over the potential outcomes and many of the stresses they might be experiencing. And so I suppose through this exploration, we start to get more in-depth insight into the specific context that these individuals operate in and how these contexts, I suppose, influence how individuals then go and experience the stresses that they do. And actually in our research, what we found was that many of the stresses that these individuals were experiencing, they actually appraised negatively as a threat or harmful for their performance and well-being. And this often led to negative emotional responses. Coaches often reported to ineffectively cope with these stresses. And this often led to a range of outcomes that we'll discuss shortly. However, I got a, a couple of quotes here just to kind of illuminate some of these situational properties and how they were reported by some of the coaches. So uh, yeah, I'd just like you to take uh, a couple of minutes just to read that on the screen and I got a, a, another quote for you as well. I suppose this particular quote is specifically linking to this self and other comparison situational property and perhaps links to this drive for coaches to obtain professional credibility. Now you can imagine that given the coaches possess this drive to obtain professional credibility in order to remain in their roles and potentially protect against uh, negative implications for their livelihood. This is probably a, a, a contributes to why individuals engage in the workload that they do and perhaps engaging in coping strategies that often rely, uh, they're often involved relying on oneself or engaging in problem solving strategies. They're often mean that they end up having to work doubly as hard, I suppose, to potentially cope, um, which then potentially exacerbates their perceptions of the workload that they have. Um, another quote for you just briefly. And I suppose with this particular quote, this is specifically linking to, again, the, the need to be able to go above and beyond, I suppose, to, to be able to support players uh, in order for them to go and perform, but also uh, meaning that they are trying to go above and beyond to perform themselves. Moving this on, I suppose what I've discussed so far are the potential underpinning reasons as to why elite football coaches in particular in the context of football uh, engage in the workload that they do. As part of my exploration of the stress and mental ill and well-being experiences of elite football coaches across the two studies, what we also sought to explore was the potential impact of the stresses that they were actually experiencing and many of the implications associated with uh, their, with their jobs, their lives away from the role and their mental ill and well-being, often heavily linked to this notion of workload. Um, and so the impact that many of the coaches reported in our research in relation to the, to the impact of workload were things like uh, workload negatively influenced their session plans and delivery by them not having enough time to be able to effectively plan. Also due to negative workload and due to appraising these stresses uh, negatively and experiencing negative emotional responses. This often translated in their coaching practice and often meant that uh, they, they were often uh, callous towards uh, the players that they might be coaching. It influenced their demeanor and often influenced their ability to be successful within that delivery. They reported then that this negatively impacted upon their relationships with players and staff. So as a result of, of workload leading to um, such perceptions and such emotional and effective responses, this often led to impacted relationships frayed relationships with key stakeholders in the clubs they were operating at. And as we suggested, and as you suggested in the chat earlier, that coaching is often a, or is suggested to be a relational role, whereby a coach's ability to be able to manage the relationships they have with key stakeholder, uh, key st stakeholders sorry, at clubs is often seen to be key in terms of their ability to go and perform. So if coaches are ineffectively coping with the majority of the demands that they're experiencing, and this leads to negative emotional responses and effective responses that then influence the relationships 
that they that they uh, have with key stakeholders, essentially this influences their ability to be effective. Um, and, and also, I suppose Brendan touched upon this point earlier, the positive relations with others is a key eudaimonic well-being dimension. And we'll come on to mental well-being shortly, but through the professional implications of ineffectively coping, what coaches are at risk of is potential mental well-being implications as a result. They also reported, um, if my screen will work, that as a result of ineffectively coping and, and this uh, experiencing higher levels of or higher perceptions of workload, that they felt that they had a decreased capacity to be able to focus on their work. And so by spending more hours focusing on work and utilizing problem solving and self-reliant strategies, essentially this links back to the point that Brenda made earlier that although they were spending more time trying to uh, solve problems, the productivity of their work often decreased due to their inability to to have the mental resource, I suppose, to go into effectively negotiating and managing those tasks. And so they also reported this, de this decreased capacity. And then finally, coaches also reported in our research that as a result of this workload associated with a job at the, elite, at the elite level of football, that they were actually in, unable to engage in personal growth, unable to engage in further CPD, which we know is vitally important for coaches to be able to to develop and, uh, and be able to perform within their roles. I suppose if we translate this in, in a way in which uh, we try and action uh, our coaching practice with athletes, what we ask of athletes is to try and engage in uh, strategies to be able to develop, whether that be physically, psychologically, technically, socially, whatever it may be. But from a coach's perspective, we are often viewing coaches these days as performers in their own right, but coaches are unable to actually engage in any personal growth or training to become more effective practitioners. And so there's this dilemma associated with becoming an effective coach. If we know that training and engaging in CPD is important for development and the ability to be able to be effective within the job, but coaches haven't got the time to actually engage in this, then I suppose it creates this dilemma associated with um, our coaches actually able to be able to engage in their roles in the most fruitful way and, and I suppose influence players or athletes in an effective manner. Moving forward, uh, or, or just before we move on, I just got a couple of quotes that, that kind of represent some of the things that I'm discussing here. And so this coach suggested that as a result of ineffectively coping with workload, that they felt strained, especially with the people that they work with, and it influenced their relationships because they felt compromised that they were essentially doing other people's jobs. And I suppose that, that kind of links to Brendan's point earlier associated with the necessity of, of having clearly defined roles and responsibilities, particularly in elite organizations for, um, uh, in order to avoid such implications. The next thing that I'm gonna to touch on here is a, a quote from a participant who suggested that what I'm seeing is my interactions with players are becoming shorter, sharper and blunter, whereas normally I dress things up not to hurt them. And so, there's often this contention by coaches, uh, particularly operating at the elite level, that they have to mask many of the demands and the emotional responses to those demands in front of key stakeholders in clubs in order to, I suppose, have this exterior of, uh, of power uh, and the ability to be in control of the situation. What coaches have uh, suggested in our research was that when they were ineffectively coping with the demands associated with their role, that they actually really struggled to be able to maintain that mask. And it was often um, meaning that their coaching practice and their, their ability to be able to engage in effective relationships with players um, was actually being thwarted and influenced negatively. And so as a result of perhaps being uh, emotionally exhausted, being tired, um, experiencing anxiety associated with ineffectively coping with demands or frustration, that was essentially coming out in coaching behaviours, which we know can potentially lead to implications for athlete performance and the way in which athletes feel through emotional contagion, transference, et cetera. Moving forward, in addition to the impact of ineffectively coping with workload on the professional uh, side of the job for elite coaches, the coaches in our research also suggested that this had many negative implications for their personal lives too. And so coaches in our research suggested that um, if my slide will just work. <laughs> I thought I was a technology whiz coming into this, but uh, maybe I'm not. Here we go. So, oh. 
Let's just see if we can go back. I think the uh, the screen glitched there. Let's see if we can go back. Here we go. So. Um, in terms of the impact of, uh, of workload on personal life, so many of the coaches reported that as a result of ineffectively coping with the, many of the demands associated with this workload, that it often meant that they had this temptation to go home and start to work from home, which generally tended to lead to what researchers call work and home life interference, which then perhaps exacerbates uh, the home life situation and potentially causes more of the negative emotional responses that we talked about earlier, which can potentially lead to more negative um, implications upon individuals' mental well-being or potential ill-being symptoms too. In fact, some of the coaches reported that as a result of ineffectively coping, that they often took the negative moods that they had from their jobs home or were often vacant with family because they were focusing so much on the job itself. And so even when coaches have not actually engage in some of the tangible uh, workload roles and responsibilities or uh, workload related roles and responsibilities, they were still often thinking about the role at home when you would arguably say they should be trying to rest, recover and maintain positive relationships with family. And so as a result of thinking about the job when at home, this, I suppose, exacerbates coaches' perceptions of, of workload even further to the point that even when they're not actually working, they're, they're, uh, engaging, in, they're engaging their mental resource into um, thinking about the job. They suggested that as a result of ineffectively coping, this often led to a lack of time and energy for family. So we mentioned earlier around kind of maintaining positive relations with others and how that's a key eudaimonic well-being component. Um, coaches reported that as a result of this workload and ineffectively managing this, that they often had a lack of time and energy for family. And this often led to some quite significant uh, relationship issues at, at, at home too. And then finally, and I suppose this exacerbates some of the points that I mentioned earlier in relation to CPD, coaches suggested in our research that when they ineffectively cope with many of the demands that they were experiencing um, and uh, uh, experienced high levels of workload, that when they went home, or when they had time off from the job, that they actually had to try and get that CPD in when they were supposed to be at home, which then obviously negatively uh, influences their relationships with family. In fact, family members or coaches in this particular study suggested that their family ended up developing resentment for the job, which then caused significant implications for their relationship, uh, relationships at home um, and exacerbated some of the negative emotional states that this coach actually felt. And so I've got a couple of quotes again, just, just to uh, illuminate some of these points. So this particular coach suggested the role so demanding, you're away a lot and they're asking where you're going uh, in terms of children. And, and because you're sat mentally and physically, you just want to pacify them and it affects your relationships with them. And so coaches are engaging in intense, uh, in uh, intensified workloads actually when they're in the job, but it even influences their relationships uh, and their lives away from the job due to constantly thinking about the job and are obviously influencing those particular relationships as a result. They also suggested, or one coach suggested, that I'll say to my wife, come on, let's go out for food. And after 10 minutes, I'll think about football. I can't switch off from it and that strange, strains our relationship. And this particular quote was the one that I was referring to earlier in terms of this particular coach suggested that his family started to resent the role that he was operating at. And I suppose Brenda mentioned earlier that we need to maintain positive states of mental well-being in order to effectively function in the job. And key to maintain an effective uh, um, or um, positive state of well-being is to be able to manage relationships and to be able to get the balance right between the demands that one experiences and how they cope with them, both in the work context and, and home context. If coaches are ineffectively managing both of these contexts, then obviously has uh, implications upon their relationships, according to some of the quotes that we're presenting here, which will naturally influence, again, how they, how they feel from a mental well-being perspective, that then might influence about uh, how they go about practicing in their, in their roles and how effective they, they go about doing that. And then finally, uh, to, to wrap this particular section up, in our work, what we sought to do was explore the stress experiences the coaches experienced in elite football uh, and explore how this influenced the job, their personal lives, but ultimately how uh, these stresses influence their mental ill and well-being. 
And what we found was that many of the coaches who, uh, who participated in our research, who were operating at the highest level of the game, were often ineffectively coping with the demands associated with their role. And as I suggested earlier, experiencing negative appraisals of those particular stresses, negatively emotionally responding, and that obviously had negative implications to their practice, et cetera. As a result of these implications upon their job and personal lives, coaches actually suggested that this led to negative perceptions of some of the eudaimonic dimensions of mental well-being. Now, some of these dimensions that we're talking about are things like their perceptions of personal growth, um, the ability to maintain positive relations with others, their sense of mastery, having a sense of purpose, their ability um, to uh, accept themselves uh, and what they're delivering in their roles. And so what we're suggesting here is that when individuals are ineffectively coping with workload demands, this influences their perceptions of some of these critical factors for maintaining eudaimonic well-being. What we also found was that when individuals experience negative perceptions of some of these factors as a result of ineffectively coping, that this then negatively influenced hedonic indicators. Now, hedonic indicators are the way in which individuals feel as a result of these perceptions of eudaimonic well-being. And some of these feeling states are linked to things like uh, job uh, satisfaction, life satisfaction, um, the ability to, to, to be happy, experience positive effects or positive emotional states. And so what we're suggesting here is that when individuals are ineffectively coping with workload, this often led to negative perceptions of eudaimonic well-being dimensions, such as sense of purpose, personal growth, positive relations with others which then led to negative feeling states. So job dissatisfaction, life dissatisfaction, negative effects, so negative emotional responses, which will naturally influence how one goes about um, uh, engaging the role effectively. So not only does ineffectively coping with workload acutely influence how individuals engage in the role, but through uh, thwarted eudaimonic well-being dimensions and subsequent um, negative hedonic implications, these individuals are likely to then go into practice from a more chronic perspective and perhaps be uh, less effective in their jobs as a result due to uh, carrying some of these negative emotional states. We also found in our research, particularly in our longitudinal study, that elite football coaches reported significantly lower levels of mental well-being during the beginning of the season phase. Now, linked to the point that, that I've just described, many of the coaches uh, reported trying to cope with many of the demands that they experienced by relying on themselves, um, probably due to the nature of the sport that they operate in and uh, high levels of job insecurity, etc. Um, but actually, when they utilize these strategies, they were often ineffective. And these ineffective coping strategies led to some of the negative perceptions, you know, eudaimonic well being, and obviously these negatively influenced hedonic indicators. Now, this was particularly prevalent at the beginning of the season because they were experiencing a range of uncontrollable demands at this particular phase. So many of our participants were experiencing poor performances, poor results, key injuries to players, et cetera, which were out of the control of the coach, which many of the demands that they experience are. And so when coaches are utilizing such uh, self-reliance and problem-solving strategies to cope with uncontrollable strategies, they often found them to be ineffective. And this obviously led to job performance, um, lifestyle issues, and mental well and ill being implications. And then finally, what we found uh, in our longitudinal study as well, and this links to some of the contentions that Bren raised earlier, was that uh, the coaches in our study reported to experience higher levels of emotional exhaustion and higher levels of uh, depersonalization at the end of the season. Now, we might have expected this particular result, and many of the research conducted before our research um, took place in, in elite football, uh, kind of representing similar findings. Um, but when we explored this from a qualitative point of view and actually asked coaches why this was the case, coaches suggested that they experienced high levels or significantly high levels of emotional exhaustion at the end of the season phase due to uh, ongoing workload. So ongoing intense workload throughout the, throughout the season, which we would probably expect. But they also suggested that as a result of ineffectively coping with this workload over time, these individuals were then taking some of the negative emotions home that was influencing their ability to maintain positive relations with their family, which was leading to work home life interference and negative um, and further exacerbated negative emotional states, which then contributed to these perceptions of emotional exhaustion. So not only were they experiencing negative emotions as a result of ineffectively coping with some of the demands associated with their job, 
but they were experiencing exacerbated negative emotional states because of the implications it was having at home. And so as a result of ineffectively coping with workload over time, this was having you know, further implications upon um, emotional exhaustion. And then from a depersonalization perspective, uh, similar findings were reported in the sense that um, coaches reported that as a result of ineffectively coping, this was often leading to uh, issues at home, issues associated with their ability to manage relationships in work. And this often leading to um, them being callous, uh, callous towards uh, colleagues, uh, frayed relationship with colleagues, and often started to uh, experience some of these enhanced depersonalization states. Now, I've, I've given you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the findings of this particular research uh, related to, to the myth that we're talking about today. I suppose before I pass back over to Brent, what I wanted to get out of this particular part of this presentation was to really exemplify how some of the contentions raised in the chapter are actually um, influencing the ability of elite football coaches in the context of elite football, which is arguably one of the most pressurized environments to operate in as a coach, given the globalization of the game, um, and how it influences coach performance and well-being. And then linking the concept of well-being. If, we're in a, if coaches are ineffectively coping with the demands associated with their role, and this is influencing well-being, how that then subsequently impacts upon their ability to be effective following those poorer experiences of mental well-being or experiences of ill-being moving forward. If anybody's interested in, in some of these findings further, um, on the screen at the beginning, there is a uh, URL to both papers that you'll obviously be able to access. And, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to delve into this research any further. I'm now going to uh, pass on to Brendan um, just to finish the talk. Thanks ever so much, Lee. Um, we are going to run slightly over, so thanks for that, Amy. Um, we've only got another 325 slides to go, so yeah, if you stick with us, we'll be done by this time next week. <laughs> I, I, th I think, um, I, as you can probably uh, tell from the amount of information that Lee's provided and, and the level of things or the number of things that we're bringing up here is that this is a very, very complex situation as we're all aware of. And there are probably few answers to kind of get this right. Um, I'm not too sure that there is a way to get this right. And considering the way in which we would define coaching or understand coaching as something that's complex, relatively ambiguous uh, and contested, that maybe we shouldn't be looking for what's right, but we should start to really think about what might work for us in the situations and contexts that we're actually working in. So hopefully the information that we've pre presented so far will, will resonate with you. And certainly yeah, there's a couple of messages in the chat around that a lot of this uh, feels like it would do in many other working roles. And I think that's the point that we're trying to make is that we need to see coaching or professional athletics, as their jobs, that's, that's essentially what they are. So. You're right, many, many of the demands that the individuals in these roles will uh, experience um, will be similar to those that are experienced in other industries and other sectors. But obviously the, the, there are contextual factors here that, that, will, uh, that will change the situation and orientate individuals to cope and manage those particular factors in different ways. I suppose to bring this to a close, we're, we're interested in your thoughts based on, on what you've heard and we totally appreciate that we have delivered a lot of information tonight. We could have just um, uh, we could have just focused in on on one particular point, but wanted to raise uh, lot, lots of different things to get you thinking about um, this stuff around the myth that we've challenged, but also around the concept of coach well-being as key to coach performance. So we, we pose this question to you really um, before we finish with with some points that we think might be quite important for us to consider. But what, what would you say uh, the one thing is that if you could change it or do it more often would allow you or the coaches that you work with to thrive more consistently if we consider thriving to be a, a combination of the experience of well-being, performance and growth? So what one thing do you think that uh, you could do or you could change that would allow for you or your, the coaches that you work with or work for to thrive more consistently? I'd be interested to see what you... Uh, put within the uh, chat there and then like I say we, we can draw things to a close and apologies for for going over with this clearly we will reflect and uh, and understand our uh, timing issues yeah 
Hey, Amy, this is a great question. How do we change the organizational cultures of working 24 seven, which it goes back to the point that somebody made previously about there's a perception that if you're in the office earlier and leave the office later, that you're working hard. But you have to, you'd either, I would have to question about the productivity of the work that happens between those hours. And as a direct result, that working longer hours or being in work longer hours doesn't necessarily lead to productive or effective outcomes. And as a result, we really have to start to think about the way in which we build, uh, not change the environment per se, but change the levels of perceptions and expectations around uh, this particular concept. And that, that's a huge challenge because it's well rooted within sport coaching and in uh, performance sport um, that everybody should be seen to be doing something. That spending time reflecting is not doing something. And as a result, if you are, you're not doing your job. Whereas I would argue that actually, if you create time for reflection, for instance, you probably learn how to do your job more productively or effectively. And as a result, probably have to spend less time doing it. So this is, this is going to take a systematic approach to, to, to changing that particular culture. Yeah, um, I'd just like to add something there as well, Brent, if you don't mind. Yeah, go um, ahead. Ju ju just in relation to that particular point as well, that al although spending more hours on the job may potentially um, feel to coaches as though they're potentially getting work done, the implications of them being able to maintain effectiveness beyond that particular point in time becomes diminished potentially as a result of some of the emotional exhaustion and the, and the feelings of, of tiredness as a result of engaging that workload. And so often we might engage in tasks for the short-term benefit of getting those tasks done, but actually the longer-term consequences on the ability to be effective in the job, perhaps in the following days, weeks, et cetera, might mean that they actually engage in less effective practice over time. And so getting the balance right is, is essentially key, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, absolutely and we totally understand that there are times in everyone's job so particularly within coaching where you're going to be overly burdened you're going to be under the pump absolutely we, we get that and there might be times where you do have to work long hours but the key is is to build in opportunities for recuperation rege regeneration and um, rejuvenation so that you're better placed to go and manage the demands that are going to happen post those periods and uh, we don't think that this probably happens a great deal in coaching uh, at this point in time uh, I'm going to pick up on a couple more points and then we'll, we'll uh, sort of conclude. Lara, I really like that idea of uh, coaches need to work together rather than competitively to so start to build this culture of communities of practice where we can share these ideas. And it links to Lee's ideas around this concept of, of more uh, engaging in more social coping mechanisms or, or uh, di dyadic coping mechanisms rather than self-reliance strategies. I think that's uh, uh, really important. Um, yeah, uh, Trish, I think you raised the question that I ask all the time. Would we expect our athletes to operate in the way we operate and then thrive at the same time? Probably not. In fact, we'd argue against it. You know, we talk all the time about rest, recovery, et cetera, for athletes so that they're able to go and perform. Yet we don't engage in those activities ourselves. And as a result, we, we probably don't position ourselves well to perform because we think that uh, we can uh, manage the demands without engaging in those types of activities, certainly. Um, yeah, Susie, slowing down, mediate more, less technology, more time spent being and not doing. I totally agree. I think it links to my point about reflection and about self-discovery, self-awareness, um, because it, it's probably those factors that are going to help you to, to solve a lot of the uh, problems that you might be faced with in a work situation. And when I say problems, I don't necessarily mean negative things. I just mean those those things that require your attention or your or your um uh, your effort or your engagement on on a daily basis certainly okay so a, a few things that we would probably advocate um i suppose the, the, sorry very quickly the first thing that i should mention I, I think this is really really important within the literature and and across all sort of media platforms we're really advocating this concept of self-care um as a mechanism to help improve well-being and, and functioning etc across different sectors i think we just have to be a little bit careful that we don't swap one dogma for another in one sense in that we go fully on this concept of self-care which is about coaches engaging in stuff or individuals engaging in stuff and and relying on their own abilities to to engage in those practices in order to feel well or experience well-being we have to balance this with the concept that we also have to change the environments in which these individuals are working in or the cultures in which they're working in 
and we unashamedly borrow this this uh, quote here um, from Alexander Den Heijer. Um, and, and this has been referred to in, in many different aspects of research, particularly in, in Mustafa Saka and David Fletcher's work in, into resilience. And for us, I think this is important because, as we said previously, we have to look at the systemic causes of the issues that have been raised tonight and try to challenge those rather than expecting coaches to fully operate within those environments uh, and just continue to engage in self-care activities. So we do need a balance, but I, I just want us to, to make sure that we continue to shine a light on both individual and organisational strategies. And as a result of that, link into Lee's work, and I'll, I'll be brief on these, and we can stay on the call for five minutes if people want to, to chat about them. Um, we want to kind of think about how we might reduce uh, coaches' reliance or over-reliance on self-reliance coping strategies. And so sort of promote this idea of um, social coping a little bit more uh, regularly or consistently within coaches' lives. I think th those aspects are really, really uh, important so that coaches don't become insular, that actually they, they are social beings, the job's are relational, so why wouldn't we cope in a, in a relational manner? I think we need to encourage organisations or have discussions with organisations, whether that be clubs, NDBs, whatever it might be, to explore those conditions that are required for thriving. Uh, so how do we create conditions in which coaches can experience well-being, both eudaimonic processes and head-on-neck outcomes, experience performance for themselves, and also experience their own growth? And maybe part of this is about making sure that organizations clearly define the roles and responsibilities or the role and responsibilities that coaches are expected to engage in and then don't deviate from that particular path even as the cultural context changes and then the final thing that we'd probably mention is this the notion that coach education providers are doing a much better job of focusing on what it means to be a coach but we do think that there's more work that can be done to focus on that that aspect of coaching rather than on coaching the sport itself so what does it mean to be a coach how do you cope with the demands of being a coach how do you manage the coaching environment those sorts of uh, topics and i appreciate coach education can't be a catch-all for all learning and um and uh, development needed to help coaches to thrive within the environments that they're going to work in but certainly it's a starting point and we can build on these things through uh, uh, continuing professional development and I suppose in, in that sense what, what we're relating to is whilst we've advocated for some time that coaches should look to support the basic psychological needs of their athletes we think that organisations need to think about the way in which they support this basic psychological needs or the satisfaction of basic psychological needs of their coaches of their employers employees sorry um, through the satisfaction of autonomy competence and relatedness and we are going to finish there because um, I appreciate that we have uh, gone significantly over and we sort of apologise for that, but timing has never been our, our uh, strongest point. We hope tonight has resonated with you. We hope that it's raised uh, some topics for further discussion. We hope that it might have got you to think about what we talked about and uh, presented in a challenging way, i.e. that you've disagreed with some of the things that we've talked about. And we certainly hope it's orientated you to potentially think about how we might make the environment or our, our work better uh, in that sense uh, moving forwards. So thank you very much for your engagement and your attention. And we will stay on for a few minutes if you want to have a chat about anything. But we do appreciate that we've taken up 15 minutes more of your time than needed. Um, I'm sure if you catch Lee at any conference or whatever soon, he'll buy you a pint or a glass of wine or a coffee or whatever your poison is to uh, say sorry. Thank you. That's typical friend. I don't think he's bought me a drink throughout the whole PhD process. <laughs> Just trying to keep you focused. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brendan and Lee. Um, that was, super, one, it was super informative, but I think hopefully what it's got people to do is start to reflect on themselves as coaches and, and their organisations. Um, one of the things I took from that was you know, how can we get organizations that employ coaches to reinforce the importance of, you know, this well-being um, and, and not the, the culture of, you know, you've got to be the first in and last out. And I know that's 
you know, a, a huge cultural thing that we, we, we need to change because it's not just from, from a sport perspective. Um, but I think that's kind of where we really need to kind of push uh, and start. Sorry to um, plug a, a project, but we've just done a uh, Colin Cronin, who was on, uh, he's had to leave, but he's just done a, a project for UK coaching on the importance of how do coaches care for themselves. Um, and throughout that project, we found this reoccurring um, kind of messages that Lee's telling us about, you know, coaches feel that they're constantly having to work these long hours to justify their role um, without very much social support, which is what you've alluded to there at the end. So it's really important how, like, how do we, how do we kind of prevent this burnout and and um, this cult, like constant um, myth from from reoccurring? Yeah, there's a the easiest answer to this, and and obviously conversations need to be had, but. If you said to somebody, would you like your employee employees to be happy, satisfied, uh, um, experience high levels of positive effect on a regular basis, experience personal growth, create meaningful relationships? And do you think people who experience those things would perform well? I'm pretty sure the universal answer would be yes. So compare that to, would you like people to work long hours, be dissatisfied, um, experience high levels of emotional exhaustion, don't feel as though they're getting rewarded for the amount of effort that they're putting in, the answer would be no. So the, the answer to that question is very simple, but the issue is, is that the time that it takes to disseminate what we know in, and put it into practice and change policy, we, we understand that that's an issue, a huge issue across sport as a sector, but I, I suppose across most sectors. And um, as researchers and practitioners, I suppose we have a, a responsibility and we need to be accountable to our field for trying to make those changes and having those conversations. It's not something that obviously is going to change overnight, but certainly it's um, it's something that we should be having. And sorry, just very quickly, seeing well-being in that way, for me, changes the whole conversation around well-being itself. And we see well-being as an aspect of performance, as a positive aspect. Whereas I think if you ask lots of people in, in the general public or the general pop, uh, coaching population, if you mention well-being, the, the first words they would think of are depression and anxiety, mm. which essentially have nothing really to do with well-being at all. They're, they're mental ill-being uh, issues. Um, and we, we have this real sort of negative connotation of what we're talking about in terms of well-being. So if we start to see it and we start to have conversations, we change the discourse around it, we really think that we can start to make positive change in organisations and it'll lead to this real focus on thriving and well-being as the fundamental aspect of that. Sorry, I just got my soapbox out for a minute. No, I think we'll leave it there, Brendan, because I don't think we can top um, uh, that, that monologue. <laughs> so... <laughs> So thanks so much again. Just uh, people are starting to leave. So I just want to kind of wrap up. Um, thank you. I do want to give a shout out to you, Brendan, with your new reflective practice book. Um, on the on the, you know the topic of well-being and the importance of reflection. Uh, I, I do want to promote that. Um, when is it out? Uh, it's, it's out um, in all good bookshops and, and plenty of bad ones in 2023 February, I, I believe, as long as um, we haven't submitted it with too many spelling mistakes. Okay, awesome. And um, I can't believe you've prompted it, by the way. I didn't prompt uh, Amy at all. <laughs> and um, our next webinar is on the 23rd of November with Dr. Sam Elliott um, from Flinders University in Adelaide. And, and Sam's going to talk about the myths around parental involvement in youth sports. So there's plenty of um, multiple myths to go at um, within that topic area. Um, thanks again. Um, we will call it there, but I think Brendan and Lee are happy to stay on for another five minutes. If anyone has got any questions and, and want to ask, um, I'm happy to stay on till 8.30 and, and host that if anyone wants to. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you.
Oh, yeah. Hi, I would have a great question, actually. <laughs> I'm doing a doctorate in sports psychology in the University of Portsmouth. And actually, all that you said today is kind of related to my research of interest. So I'm looking at how sport organization can support women coaches specifically. And we are thinking about um, community of practice as well and to look around that and the social coping kind of element of that. And Leah was kind of interested to know, like if you had kind of look at, at like in, into gender, because obviously there's a lot of research around um, a workload and, and the, the gender effect. So I was just really interested to know that. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as part of my research, this was solely focused on um, the experiences uh, uh, of males at the elite level of the game. So it's not something that I explored specifically in my PhD. It's definitely something that I'd like to explore in the future. Um, and it's definitely opportunity, I think, as the, as the women's game grows and as the globalization of the women's game glo uh, grows, naturally, that will tend to lead to enhanced perceptions of pressure for women coaches and and some of the some of the performance stresses that, that that we see also existing today in the in the male game. So definitely something I want to explore further. I've seen some of the research coming out by Faye Didimus and other researchers in recent times, um, looking at the kind of stress and well-being experiences of women coaches in particular. Really insightful, particularly around some of the differences and some of the similarities that you might see, but also some of the unfortunate conditions that might contribute.